Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. This is your host Amina Ahmed and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Welcome back to another episode of Next Gen where we speak with today's young people, young leaders, activists and organizers about the work that they are doing with their community. You're all watching us on Galaxy 19 satellite, muslimnetwork.tv, Amazon Fire TV, Roku and Apple TV as well. Now, today's discussion is on the new amendments that France Senate, Fran France's Senate has recently passed, banning women under the age of 18 from wearing a hijab, completely banning the burkini religious swimsuit or a, a more covering swimsuit that Muslim women wear at beaches, at the pool, also banning parents from showing any religious signs, which means that hijabi Muslim mothers would not be able uh, to participate in their kids' extracurriculars. Uh, there is also more, right? I'm listing all these things and, you know, um, it, it seems to not end France's Islamophobia. Women or anybody showing any religious signs will not be able to participate in a sport that is hosted by a federation or a sports association. Um, and, and this is kind of just the beginning of France is uh, Islamophobia. We've also discussed French Fran French Islamophobia before uh, with uh, Reem Sara Alawand, a journalist, but this was before these new amendments have been passed in France's Senate. So to further discuss the uh, French hijab ban, we have with us Monia Bagheera. Monia Bagheera is a social activist fighting racism and Islamophobia in France. She's a member of the political party union of French Muslim Democrats. She's phenomenal doing work day in and day out uh, fighting this ban and Islamophobia in general in France. Thank you for being here with us today. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. Wa alaikum as Monia. And Monia, I want to start off with kind of laying a ground. How are these new amendments different from what we already have in law enacted in France today? Uh, well, as you said, these new amendments are, are trying to ban hijab for girls under the age of 18, for mothers accompanying school, school trips, um, also banning uh, the use of burkinis in public schools, in public swimming pools, sorry. So by imposing these restrictions on Muslim women, France is actually violating its obligations to human, universal human rights. And this bill has not come into force yet because it has to be voted and, um, by the, the National Assembly. But if it is passed, the age of consent for sex will be lower than the age of consent for wearing a hijab. Therefore, women as young as 15 years old will have uh, sexual autonomy in France, but they will not have the right to choose the symbol of their religious faith. Now, do you think that once this does go into the National Assembly, once it's up for debate there, do you think that it will pass? Um, well, most analysts say that it will not pass, but the, the, the simple fact that it is being questioned is problematic and it is very dangerous. So a lot of organizations, more than 80 organizations in France have decided to, to organize a coalition called the Front Against Islamophobia in order to collectively resist this discriminating bill. So you are part of the Front Against Islamophobia. What work are you guys doing? What what do you seek to do, right? What is your goal? Our goal is to um, is to remind our government that it is actually violating our freedom of religion, our freedom of belief, which is guaranteed by Article 18 um, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was actually uh, proclaimed by the, the United Nations in, gen in the General Assembly, ironically in Paris on December mm -hmm. 10th, 1948, which says that everyone shall have the freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right shall include freedom to have a religion or whatever belief of choice and freedom, either individually or collectively with others in public or private to manifest our religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. Um, our organization, the Front Against Islamophobia, um, has organized huge demonstrations. Thousands of Muslims marched in the streets of France to express their dissatisfaction in more than 10 cities across the country. 
So that's what basically we're doing. And we, we also started. I'm sorry. No worries, you just cut out a bit. So you were saying that um, you're the Front Against Islamophobia, you guys have demonstrated marches of thousands of French protesters. And you were saying, you know, continuing that you guys have been doing more. Tell us, you know, about the Front Against Islamophobia. Yeah, uh, we are determined to defend our freedom of thought, of conscience and religion. And therefore, our coalition is representing thousands of Muslim citizens. We have started this petition on change.org. Um, to demand the French government to withdraw the anti-separatism bill, which is clearly Islamophobic, and to withdraw as well the 2004 law forbidding hijab for schools, for school girls, sorry. Right, and I think that just from the work that your organization is doing, we can see that the French Muslim population is completely against what is happening. They seem to be mobilized, am I correct? Yes. Um, we are more, um, more lights, but some of us, some of the, some people in the Muslim community is also scared and afraid. Some mm -hmm. girls are taken off the hijab. They choose to, 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 they, they, they believe that in order to go to school, to get a job, they must, uh, um, uh, somehow, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stop being a Muslim outside and, and stop wearing the hijab. And therefore it's problematic for us. Because France is supposed to be the country of human rights, the country of liberty, and it is our motto: liberty, equality, and fraternity. And um, and basically, um, most of the of the human rights activists are determined, and we vow to to defend our freedom, basically. So the Muslim population in France, the majority of it is mobilized. You know, there are some who are fearful and those who advocate for human rights. What about the rest of the French po uh, population, those who aren't Muslim, uh, maybe, you know, the, the middle class men? How does that, how does he or she uh, feel about what is happening to Muslims in France today? Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a lot of support from our fellow citizens uh, among the French uh, society. Uh, some people believe it's a Muslim problem, and um, a lot, a lot, a lot of French people vote for the far right parties because they believe that we are a threat. That Muslims are, you know, by conflating Islam and terrorism, which has what the politicians and the media have done for a long time now. Um, a lot of people are also afraid of of um, being replaced. You know, there is this crazy theory called the Great Replacement, saying that one day there will be more Muslims than non-Muslim um, citizens in France, and therefore uh, the French um, the French identity would be endangered and jeopardized. Um, you know, it's it's very difficult to have support from um, non-Muslim. Uh, from our non-Muslim uh, uh, citizens. Right, and is the Front uh, Against Islamophobia, are you guys doing any outreach to French citizens uh, who might not completely um, support, you know, what is happening in France? They might not, but but they're a bit neutral. You know, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who uh, aren't taking any stance because, like you said, they believe it is a Muslim issue. Are you doing any outreach, trying to get support uh, from these people? Yeah, sure. We're we're trying, but you know, the, we we're facing a terrible pandemic, and uh, well, with, um, it's kind of complicated. Yeah. We're under curfew, yeah. and uh, the lockdown as well. And uh, we have social issues with the yellow vest uh, protesters, etc. So it's pretty complicated for us. No. Right. So I, I understand at the moment, I think all activists, all people who work in any advocacy can tell you that, you know, the work never stops. But because of the pandemic, I'm sure that it has been impacted. Um, Monia, we will continue to speak about your work and the implications of this hijab ban right after our short break. You're all watching us on Muslim Network TV, Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Roku and Apple TV as well. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Next Gen. I'm here with Monia Bagheera speaking about France's hijab ban. Now, Monia, for young girls who are younger, you know, who are younger than 18, um, what does this mean for them who, who want to wear the hijab? You know, I started wearing the hijab at a young age as well, completely my choice. And I know my friends, my sisters, and obviously everyone has a different experience with hijab. But um, the, many of the people around me, you know, wore it from their own choice and wore it before they turn 18. What does this mean for young Muslim women in France? Well, for most young uh, women who choose to wear the hijab, it's a personal choice, and um, it's uh, and a fortune, unfortunately, in France, a lot of uh, politicians and journalists and the media consider that they are being manipulated by their fathers or their husbands or whoever, and then they they believe that they have to protect those girls who are being manipulated refusing to admit that some of them have chosen and, and it's a it's really uh their choice uh we live in the in the country in a country where everybody is free to do whatever they want to wear whatever garment or um, outfit they want and um it's just a pretext you know to to attack um the same minority Right. And I think that belief that um, many hijabi women are oppressed or forced to wear hijab and, 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 you know, the hijab means oppression and suppression of Muslim women stems from a lot of Islamophobic thought. Uh, do you think that the left wing, the rise of the left wing, um, uh, the rise of the right wing, my, my apologies, in France, you spoke about how many of the French middle class also support the right wing um, today. So d does that correspond with the rise of Islamophobia? Yes, um, the terrorist attacks that occurred in France increased Islamophobia, and um, somehow they needed to find um, uh, to target it at um, you know uh, how shall I say because because French intelligence has failed preventing the terrorist attack. They started pointing at us as if we were. Um, responsible somehow for those terrorist attacks and they pretend that all the terrorists are Muslims therefore Muslims are potential terrorists and some people consider us here in France as the enemy within you know like um, as if we were they were uh, they had the right to hold us accountable for those terrorist mm -hmm. attacks which is ridiculous of course and we have the impression that History is repeating itself. You know, in the 1930s here in France, the Jews, the Jewish population was considered as the enemy within. Mm -hmm. And um, some politicians have used this expression as well for Muslims. We are um, responsible for all the problems we're facing here in France. But, you know, it's just what we call Islamo diversion, using Islam and Muslims as a diversion to, 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 not to talk about the real issues, the most important issues, the, our priorities. Our priorities should be uh, the pandemic and um, the social crisis and and all, you know, ecology problems, stuff like that. Global warming. I don't know. There are a lot of issues that are certainly more important than the hijab. Right. Um, and, and I think that, like you said previously, that, you know, the hijab is a very personal choice to many women. Uh, but it seems that politicians are scapegoating Muslims in, instead of addressing uh, the real issues. We actually had that obviously happen here in the United States post 9-11. And, you know, what, what you're saying is taking me, um, you know, to that, the fact that uh, Muslims here were, were also scapegoated. So to our audience, um, who is American, you know, they can probably relate to living in a post 9-11 world and being Muslim and being seen as the enemy. And obviously this was a way to divert attention from, um, you know, uh, the real issues here in America as well. And, and we see that happening in France right now. But in France, do you feel that um, there is enough awareness about what is happening, uh, uh, you know, or, or um, French issues? Do you feel that people around the world are aware uh, of what's happening in France? Well, more and more people are aware of what's going on in France, thanks to the social media, social networks, etc. But um, I, I, I fear that it's not um, well known enough because um, France is supposed to be the country, as I said, the country of human rights. And whenever uh, bills um, 
Islamophobic bills have been voted here in France. Other countries around Europe have passed mm -hmm. the same laws. I'm talking about the burqa ban, the ban of burqa, um, which was voted in 2010 in France, and then in 2013 it was in Belgium, and then in Spain, and then in in uh, the Netherlands, etc. So um, we are aware that we ha France has a responsibility around the world because we. Um, our country pretends to be the, the country of human rights. And nowadays they are actually violating our rights, our basic rights. And I don't see a lot of people really taking um, taking the situation seriously. I, I mean, there was um, a boycott campaign that was launched in the in, in Muslim countries um, trying to, to um, you know, to, to to force France to withdraw their these, these Islamophobic um, bills, but so far we haven't noticed any any effects, any results. So we're hoping that uh, we will get more, you know, more support worldwide. And and I hope so too. What do you think people around the world can do to support you, to uh, uplift your voices, to amplify your voices in the work that you do? Uh, what can we do here in America? Um, well, first, uh, this, uh, you are helping us because you're talking about this issue. You're, uh, so thank you for having me again. Really, it's really important. And it's, uh, um, you know, you can um, uh, share the petition, for example, and um, maybe, um, you know, by lo lobbying or, I don't know, talking to uh, politicians, um, foreign about foreign policy and the relationship between our countries. So maybe um, if other, uh, I don't know, maybe if other countries, um, the Turkish president has tried to do it and other presidents in other countries have tried to do it uh, by supporting Muslim, French Muslims, then maybe uh, our government, our president will be forced to consider that um, what he's doing is, is actually violating the human rights. So we right. definitely need you and your support. So next time we talk to our politicians about anything regarding uh, foreign policy, which we tend to do here a lot. I think that the Muslim population in America is extremely mobilized, you know, we're connected uh, politically. So hopefully we can bring this issue up as well and let our politicians know that we are dissatisfied with uh, France, which, like you said before, claims to uphold human rights and is not doing that uh, whatsoever. Rather, it's doing the complete opposite by suppressing uh, Muslim voices. And like you said, uh, also sign that petition. We have linked it here. So hopefully, you know, it takes less than a minute to sign a petition. It's not difficult at all. So uh, hopefully to everyone that is watching, if you can just quickly go and sign that petition, that would be amazing. But lastly, Monia, you know, time flies when, I, when I'm, you know, discussing with you. And thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge with us. But I, I want to ask, you know, Monia, do you think that these laws are just the beginning of what France wants to do, um, of their action against Muslims? We're, we're also seeing, you know, increased surveillance against uh, younger Muslims as well. Do you think that this is just the start? I hope it's not just the start, but unfortunately, we're very pessimistic because uh, uh, you know, anything is possible. We wouldn't have believed that there could be camps for Muslims anywhere in the world in 21st century, but there are camps today in China for Uyghur Muslims. And uh, we have that politician who proposed the bill to create internment camps for, for um, you know, for some people who were suspected of being um, uh, related to terrorist attacks whatsoever and you know as i said history is repeating itself and, and during the 1930s the jews were sent to uh to camps you know and they were killed massively and we don't know what might happen so yeah we are definitely worried and concerned about what will happen next that's why we need to say no right now and to fight for for our, our, to defend our rights and our freedom, our dignity.
Yeah, and hopefully we won't get to that point and, you know, um, we have to take action from now, like you said, because if we're silent, then, like you said, it's just going to get uh, worse. So thank you, uh, Monia, for being here with us. Thank you for sharing uh, the work that you do. Very welcome. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to Next Gen. We'll be back next week actually speaking about Ramadan and how young people uh, can participate in Ramadan, gain all the blessings of Ramadan uh, while participating in school and all the other things, extracurriculars that they do. So thank you all for watching and we'll be back next week. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Bye.